Have you ever observed how after an injury, your blood stops pouring out and after a while the injury site is blocked by something and then after a while even the injury disappears? Well, the process by which the blood flow was stopped from that site of injury is known as coagulation of blood. And in today's video, we're going to talk about the process by which blood coagulates or clots inside your body. Now, say that this is a blood vessel. You have different components in blood like red blood cells, white blood cells and also platelets. Platelets are not actually cells. They are smaller pieces of larger cells that were formed during the process of platelet formation. So, suppose this is the blood vessel and this is where the injury is caused. So, now blood starts to pour out through this injury site. This is not good for the body because we cannot lose too much blood. So, it is the body's duty to block this injury site with something so that the blood flow can be stopped. Not only that, open injury sites are hotbeds for bacterial infections and other microorganisms to enter our body. So, the body has to make sure that the injury site is perfectly closed up, thereby preventing blood loss and the entry of microorganisms. How does this occur? The process by which blood clots is taken care by the platelets. And how do platelets clot blood? You see, platelets don't clot blood at random times. They clot only when there is an injury. How do platelets know that there is an injury? Well, that has to do with the cells lining the blood vessels. Those cells are known as endothelial cells and they are tightly packed next to one another with not much gap between them. And when there is an injury, the endothelial cells, they break open. And when they break open, they release some chemicals into the blood, some substances into the blood that triggers the platelets to jump into action. So, what happens is, say these are the endothelial cells, you have something known as the extracellular matrix that is located outside the cells. The extracellular matrix is made up of a protein known as collagen and it offers support and structure to the cells and tissues. So, when the endothelial cells break open, certain chemicals are released into the bloodstream and the platelets also come in contact with the collagen. Now, normally this does not happen if the cells are intact. When the endothelial cells are not broken, say this is the blood vessel and this is the extracellular matrix, the platelets do not come in contact with the collagen of the extracellular matrix. So, in this case, when there is no injury, platelets need not jump into action and form any blood clots, which is good for us because if this process were not regulated, then platelets would keep forming blood clots at all times at random places, which is not good for our circulatory system. So, the platelets have a mechanism to jump into action only when there is an injury. And how do platelets form blood clots? So, initially what happens is when the platelets come in contact with collagen, the platelets, they begin to clump up together, forming a platelet plug at the site of injury. Now, this platelet plug is a temporary structure. It blocks the blood flow, fine, blood cannot escape from this injury site, but this is not enough to completely stop the blood flow and to start the healing process. So, say if there is an injury, the injury needs to heal, right? The body needs to repair that injury, right? So, what helps this platelet plug is something known as the fibrin mesh. And what is this fibrin mesh? A fibrin mesh is a net-like structure that goes and forms on top of the platelet plug and holds that platelet plug in place so that blood cannot escape the site of injury. Now, how is this fibrin mesh formed? It is formed from something known as fibrin. Now, fibrin is the active form of this protein, but in its active form, it is a highly polymerizable substance, which means if it exists in the active form, it does not exist as individual strands. Instead, the strands keep polymerizing with one another, forming the fibrin mesh. But this is not good for us because if fibrin were to be found in its active stage in the blood, then blood would keep clotting continuously in the body at random places. To make sure that fibrin is activated only when there is an injury, Fibrin exists in the form of fibrinogen in the blood, which is its inactive form. 
So along with red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets, the blood also has fibrinogen. And when is this fibrinogen triggered to form fibrin? That is when platelet plug is formed that triggers the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And the process that converts the inactive fibrinogen to active fibrin and the formation of this fibrin mesh is known as the coagulation cascade blood coagulation cascade. Now, why is this called a cascade? I'll explain that in just a while. But you can remember the terms coagulation and clot basically mean the same. It's a clotting cascade or the coagulation cascade. How does this coagulation cascade work? There are around 13 proteins that are involved in this coagulation cascade and it's quite a complicated process. But for the sake of simplicity, let's focus on few of those proteins. And one such protein is known as thromboplastin, which is released by the broken endothelial cells. Thromboplastin is also known as tissue factor and it triggers a series of reactions that ends in fibrinogen being converted to fibrin. Now let's take a look at few of the steps involved in that reaction. So initially, thromboplastin is converted to prothrombin. Remember that thromboplastin is also not the active form of the protein that is needed to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. Even this thromboplastin is an inactive protein. It needs to be converted to thrombin, which is the actual protein that converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Initially, thromboplastin is converted to prothrombin and prothrombin is converted to thrombin. It's not a simple step that occurs in two steps here, but instead it's a cascade reaction where one protein triggers the activation of other proteins and that protein triggers the activation of more proteins. That is why it is known as the coagulation cascade. But one of the end results of the cascade is the activation of thrombin from thromboplastin. And what this thrombin does is that it finally converts the inactive fibrinogen to active fibrin. Once the active fibrin is formed, the fibrin mesh can be formed. This fibrin mesh goes ahead and helps the platelet plug block the site of injury. It forms the mesh around the platelet plug, fully engulfing the platelet plug, thereby completely sealing this site of injury. This way, when the fibrin mesh is formed, no more blood can escape the site of injury and also it prevents the entry of microorganisms into the body. Now, once the fibrin mesh has done its job and once the process of injury repair begins to occur, the fibrin mesh slowly dissolves and that is also regulated by the proteins involved in the coagulation cascade. Now, I keep mentioning that it is a coagulation cascade. What exactly does it mean? Say you have to complete a huge task. You are just one person. You cannot finish it in a day and it needs to be done very quickly. You need to give the results in a few days. What you do is you ask two of your friends to help you. And then you realize that even with two of your friends, you cannot finish that task in the desired time. So what you do is you ask two of these friends to get more of their friends to help you out. And then you ask each of these people to get more people to help you out. At the end, what you have is a cascade of people working to help you to finish that task for you. That is exactly what happens in the coagulation process. It is a cascade that is triggered by the activation of a protein. Say this is the protein here. This protein goes ahead and triggers the activation of other proteins and these proteins then trigger the activation of more proteins. The end result of this coagulation cascade is the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin with the help of thrombin and the eventual forming of the fibrin mesh. That is why this is known as the coagulation cascade and the proteins involved in this process are known as clotting factors and there are almost 13 clotting factors in the blood. 
Now, why do you think there are so many proteins involved and why do you think this is a cascade mechanism? Well, because this process needs to be very minutely regulated. Even a single misstep would prevent fibrinogen from being converted to fibrin and the entire coagulation process might not even work. So that's why the body needs to regulate it at a minute level and to regulate it at a minute level, it uses the help of these 13 clotting factors, the 13 proteins in our blood to make sure that the platelet plug is covered with this fibrin mesh. There are a lot of genetic disorders that involve these clotting factors. So what happens is mutations in the genes that code for these proteins might cause some of these proteins to be produced in less quantity or sometimes no proteins are even produced. When that happens, the entire clotting cascade, this coagulation cascade sometimes is affected and that results in uncontrollable bleeding. And an example of such a genetic disorder that affects these clotting factors is hemophilia. So the next time you see your blood clot up fast after you have an injury, really thank your platelets and your clotting factors. They are the ones that are making that possible.